Welcoming Tom back uh, to uh, Colorado Springs today and yesterday, and it's really great to have him back here. He keeps on coming back, um, drawn to the mountains, I guess. Uh, Tom is a 78 graduate, a 1978 graduate of Colorado College. Um, he was advised by one of our own council members, David Finley. Um, David, would you stand up and just take a little bit of credit for your advisory work? Because it was, yes, thank you. David is a professor of Russian politics, was uh, able to inspire Tom and give him the background necessary to become uh, the International Herald Tribune uh, correspondent in Moscow uh, when the Soviet Union literally collapsed around Tom's uh, eyes, you know, just uh, while he was there. Uh, prior to that, though, he was actually a, um, uh, a, a uh, he went to the Fletcher School, which is actually my alma mater, and uh, 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 Sky did uh, work there as well. Um, then he went to, he joined the uh, International Herald Tribune in uh, the mid-1980s. Uh, my colleague David Hendrickson likes to say that uh, Tom is like the Forrest Gump of journalism. He is everywhere when, <laughs> when something is going on. As I mentioned, he was there in the uh, Soviet Union when it was falling apart. He came back. Uh, 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 to the Pentagon in 1990 to cover the Gulf War. Then he returned to watch the final death blows of the Soviet Union in 1991-92. When that got a little boring, he went to the Balkans to cover the war there in 1992 to 1994. Tom was the first reporter to have the sensitivity and uh, insight to realize that what was going on in the Balkans in 1992 was not just boys being boys in a wartime zone, but actually a systematic, organized campaign of rape as a weapon of war uh, in that period. And he blew the, that sto story open. He was the first person. Uh, and from Tom's initial reporting to um, the ruling by the International uh, uh, Tribunal uh, that rape is a, is a war crime uh, back in, 19, in, in 2000, uh, there was a direct line, and Tom started that going, so we have him to thank for that in, in improvement in international law. Tom joined the New York Times in 1997, where uh, uh, when the Gulf War started and the Afghan War started, he has been embedded uh, in the field with our troops on several occasions, and I'm sure you've all been reading his reporting. So with that, let me turn it over to Tom. Oh, by the way, I have to plug his book, Counter-Strike. The Untold Story of America's Secret Campaign Against Al-Qaeda just came out. It's an excellent read. I'm going to sign it for my American Foreign Policy course this fall. But thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, it's always quite wonderful when Professor Henriksen describes me as the Forrest Gump, because I guess in, in my career, I always have been at all of these right places or wrong places at just the right time. But as you know, the second part of that story is that Forrest Gump was completely clueless throughout. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know what all of my, my mentors have, have been saying. Um, it's been a real treat to be back uh, in, in Colorado Springs. And I spoke last night uh, on campus about the book. I will spare you all. This is not a book talk. Um, I, I gave that with both barrels to the students and then lectured on campus today to a journalism class and to an IR class. And when I, when I showed up, um, you know, I might just come off. Let's see here. This will work a lot. Nope. Okay. All right. Okay. I was just trying to get get closer, closer my maker microphone to thee. Um, you know, I showed up on campus this morning dressed the way I am now, and somebody said, "You're you're a little overdressed for a college campus." And and it wasn't that I wanted to give them the full Monty, but I wanted to give them the the full bald middle-aged white guy, because you know that's that's just what I am and who I am and. 
I, I embrace it madly. In fact, Sky was telling me before that one of his uh, tours was in Vienna working on the CFE. And during my five years in Moscow, we used to escape to, to, to Vienna for, uh, for fresh food and pastries and doctor's appointments. And while there, I would always, every trip to Vienna, I would take flowers to the statue of Gutenberg that's in Vienna. Because without Gutenberg, I wouldn't have a job. I mean, I, I am a really old-fashioned journalist. A couple of birthdays ago, my, my two sons went out and bought me a dinosaur tie because that's what I am. And usually when I speak, that's my only audio-visual device. And my, my wife says that my first byline, I've been covering the military for a very long time, and she says that my first byline was covering the, the tactical advance of the children of Israel against the overpowering forces of Pharaoh and the meteorological <laughs> accident that allowed them to, but I, that, that's not true. I really wasn't there. Um, but what I am, I'm, I'm a military beat reporter. It's what I've been doing just about forever. And, and I mentioned that to, to start with because to me, the title beat reporter is an honorific. It's a calling, even though mostly my, my editors hear it as an imperative, as in beat the reporter. Um, but what, what I do as a Pentagon beat reporter is spend every day walking the halls of the Pentagon, up on Capitol Hill, working the interagency, talking to people in the think tank community, and most importantly, spending a lot of time with the great young men and women in uniform. Uh, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, where I've been going four, five, six times a year since, since 2001. And so what, what I thought I, I would come tonight is sort of to describe to you the way the national security environment looks in Washington, D.C. And I stress the beat reporter aspect because in front of a very well-informed audience like this, I want to give you a caveat what I can do and what I can't do. I can describe what is, but I'm not here to give you an opinion. I'm not here to prescribe answers. That's for all of you as taxpayers, voters, those of you in public service. Um, I'm not an editorial writer or a columnist. Um, actually, I, I don't like partisan politics at all, and I think that this stance that I've taken allows me to be partisan for a set of political ideals that I, I learned, um, you know, really back at CC under professors like David Finley, which is the importance of a free media um, to describe what's going on out there. Whenever I speak to military audiences, I tell them that, that like it or not, you know, the military and the media are like a marriage. Now, it's a dysfunctional marriage to be sure, but we stay together for the kids. Um, <laughs> What do I mean by that? You know, military officers very much have every right to be proud of the young men and women in their unit. And they should want their stories to be told. There are great stories out there. And it's important those stories are told to my kids, who are the readers of the New York Times, and by extension, every voter and taxpayer in America who offer up a lot of their treasury, and even more, their sons and daughters and husbands and wives. So in this kind of dysfunctional marriage between what I do and what the military does, I wanted to sort of talk you through the national security scene in Washington today. And as an organizing principle, there's one war that we're out of, there's one war that we're trying to get out of, there's one war we don't want to get into, and there's a war that we just can't win. Okay, the war we're out of is Iraq, of course. The war we're getting out of is, in, is Afghanistan. The war we don't want to get into Iran, and the war we're never going to win is with the budget. So those are the kind of four <laughs> themes I'm going to talk to you about tonight. And then after I'm through sort of trying to make you laugh, trying to give you a little insight, uh, we'll have a wonderful role reversal and you get to ask me questions for a few minutes. And by all means, if y'all get hungry or thirsty, a drunk audience is a better audience. So <laughs> you're not going to hurt my feelings if you get up and wander off for another round. Fair enough. Um, the war that we're out of, Iraq. Um, after traveling to Iraq basically three or four times a year since the invasion of 03, I was in Baghdad in December for the casing of the colors. The final ceremony where they rolled up the colors and ended the mission and came home. And the ceremony was at, at Camp Victory, 
which at best was aspirationally named and at worst was quite premature and incorrect. Um, and, you know, I'm an Old Testament kind of guy, not a New Testament kind of guy, but I, I will quote 1 Corinthians to you. The entire ceremony had the sound of an uncertain trumpet because we were leaving at the very uncertain conclusion of a mission. To be sure, a dictator was ousted. But as we all know, the original rationale for invading Iraq, originally weapons of mass destruction, then to democratize the Middle East, then as a counterterrorism mission. Again, it's up to all of you into history whether it was the right war or the wrong war, but it was a war of choice regardless. And, and I, I stood there that day after investing months and months of my life, really kind of uncertain how to, to, to judge this. The military, as most of you know from reading the Times and other papers, wanted to keep a residual force of between 7,000, maybe 15,000, maybe up to 30,000 within Iraq to sustain the partnering, the mentoring, the training, because Iraq remains a very unstable place. But Prime Minister Nuri Kamal al-Maliki, for very, I guess, understandable domestic political considerations, did not want to sign a follow-on status of forces agreement. And so now all American combat forces are out of Iraq. And there's just a very small military liaison team there. The future of Iraq is really very uncertain. Um, Al-Qaeda-affiliated violence is on the rise. Um, there's some concern that Maliki, as a Shiite leader, is going to get too cozy with Iran. But I think just a look at the history shows that you know the Shia of Iraq are very very proud people, and they are, in many ways, Iraqis first and Shiite second. So I think it's less a concern that Iran will try to exert influence there than simply that Iraq will not be as stable a place as it might have been otherwise and as a bulwark against extremism in the, the region. And so the job now for the Amer American military is to pivot out of Iraq and reposition to guarantee American national security interests there. And Central Command has done some very clever things. There was an armored brigade that came out of Iraq in December, but it hadn't finished its full deployment time, its full year. So it didn't stay in Iraq, but it's parked in Kuwait right now until the end of its boots on the ground time expires. So there are American military forces still very close by. I think you'll see increased deployment of minesweepers in the region, obviously. Uh, naval deployments, uh, the, uh, the footprint of the Air Force remains very robust in the region, especially with the unmanned intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance vehicles that have been an absolute game changer in the American way of war since 9-11. So that's the picture from Iraq. Um, Af Afghanistan is also equally un unsettled. Uh, I was there just two months ago, and it was just before Secretary Panetta spoke at the Verkunda National Security Conference in Germany, at which he surprised everybody, including his own staff, when he said that the American combat mission in Afghanistan will end in 2013. Now, as most of you know, the NATO-endorsed mission runs through 2014, when all the American forces and NATO forces are supposed to come home. What Panetta did, in essence, was backtrack the end of the American hands-on combat role by a full year and a half. Nobody was expecting this announcement. Perhaps we thought it would come at the NATO summit in, in Chicago, but Panetta likes to brag that he's an Italian-American who <laughs> likes to gab, and he just couldn't keep the secret any longer. But the challenge to us as reporters is to understand what this change in mission really meant. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, my uh, you know, reporting partner, Eric Schmidt, and I kind of popped an interesting scoop that really described for the first time what the campaign plan for Afghanistan is going to look like moving ahead. To be sure, the Secretary was right. Americans will no longer conduct direct combat missions beginning in 2013. There will be a lot of forces withdrawn uh, this coming fall. In fact, the end of the surge forces come out. And I also think that when the NATO summit meets in the president's hometown of Chicago in May, we'll see an even more accelerated withdrawal timeline announced. So what's going to happen in Afghanistan? The special operations forces, which have become so effective and so efficient and so agile, um, will remain in Afghanistan at their present numbers 
perhaps even be plussed up a little bit. So as the conventional force draws down, the special operations force will become an ever larger percentage. And for the first time, late 2013 into 2014, maybe beyond, it will be a special operations mission in Afghanistan commanded by special operations forces. What are they going to do? They're going to be embedded within Afghan security forces, helping to uh, improve their professionalism, improve their effectiveness, and they'll continue to carry out the kind of kinetic, high-value attacks on important insurgent and terrorist targets. But you will not see the kind of large-scale patrols by conventional forces that produce the casualties that are so controversial at home and produce a lot of the offensive activities that uh, have riled the Afghan people. So it will be a very small footprint of very well-trained, very well-tailored forces. But that really doesn't solve all the problems because the Afghan security forces are going to need not just mentoring by our special operators, they're going to need a lot of money. I mean, it's hard to imagine that the budget of the Afghan security forces is larger than the GDP of Afghanistan itself. And so how do you sustain that for the long term without a lot of, of Western input? You know, people always ask me, what's Afghanistan going to look like? And if I could predict that well, I'd be a stockbroker, not a journalist. But one can sort of imagine a post-2014 Afghanistan where you have an increase of Taliban influence in the South. And at the risk of being ironic, and I don't mean to be, um, they're going to have to be kind of a kinder, gentler Taliban. I mean, because after 11 years of some kind of democracy, that's really kind, sir. Thank you so much. Oh, it's Jim. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you know, even increased Taliban influence will have to be a little more sensitive to the people's desires. So you can see a, a Taliban increasing their influence in the South and the East. In the North and the West, which are relatively passive today, one could see an increase in warlordism, the tribalism that's been there for a long time. And in Kabul, you know, President Karzai could be something like the president of Kabul County, Afghanistan, and not much more than that. But still, it would be a relatively stable place. And what's interesting to me, as someone who's followed both the military campaign and the politics of this, is that President Obama, who really campaigned as a change agent, you know, hope and change, hope and change, has, in foreign policy, become an ultimate realist, a really hardcore, what are our basic interests, and let's stop there. Because what Obama is saying in action and decision, if not in words, is that an Afghanistan that will never again be a launching pad for transnational terror attacks against the US or its allies is good enough. And after 11 years, trillion dollars, thousands of casualties, America has had enough and it's up to the Afghan people. And that's very interesting because in some ways it's back to the future. The original mission, because I went in to Kandahar in December of 01 with the special forces with Hamid Karzai that won the war there. Their mission was just that, topple the Taliban, oust al-Qaeda, go home. But then the mission evolved into nation building, encounter insurgency. And again, I'm not judging right or wrong here. I'm just describing the historic timeline. And you know, Secretary Gates said, we should never have tried to make Valhalla in Afghanistan. You know, we couldn't even do Switzerland there, let alone <laughs> Jeffersonian democracy. And we've gone, we, we've evolved beyond that because the military likes to say, well, let's just leave it at Afghan good enough. No, when we leave it in 2014, it's Afghan we don't care anymore so long as you're not a basis for transnational terrorism. And if you're an absolute, real, uh, an absolute realist, you sort of can't quibble with that being the end state despite all the sacrifice that this country has endured in that country for the past decade plus. Now, <coughs> on to the really fun stuff, the budget. Um, Admiral Mullen, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had a wonderful bumper sticker on this. He said, we ain't safe if we're broke. 
And, and it's so interesting in so many ways that those in uniform understand the national body politic often better than those running for office. And Admiral Mullen realized that unless the Pentagon did its share in cutting the budget, the military would lose the, the support that it needs from, from all of you. And Panetta, it's interesting to look at his resume because I spent five years in Moscow. I, I read people's backgrounds like, like you know, Pravda, and I want to see, you know, where they served and all that. And we should remember, you know, that Panetta is a former OMB director, member of the Budget Committee in Congress. I mean, the president picked him for very specific reasons. I mean, Bush hired Bob Gates to fix Iraq, and Obama kept him on to fix Afghanistan, and Obama hired Panetta to fix the budget. So the five-year spending plan that Panetta's put forward already cuts $489 billion. So this will be the first real decrease in military spending since 9-11. And for the first time, you know, with that spigot of water, you know, being turned off, the Pentagon's having to make some real, honest-to-goodness, tough decisions about where the money goes. <clears throat> so if you were looking at this as an investment, the areas to put your money are special operations, get a lot of bang for, for the buck, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, predators, reapers. I see some young cadets here. I don't know whether you guys want to be you know, fighter or bomber pilots, but my friends, your future is an ISR. That is the growth industry for the Air Force, and your service has got to embrace it. That, that's where the money is. And the third is cyber. I mean, th this is the future of American national security strategy. You know, as Secretary Gates left office, he said, any president who again orders a ground war in Asia needs to have his head examined. And I think that's really how the nation feels today. So what do our future deployments look like? Well, they're going to be small footprint. The goal is to work by, with, and through our allies and partners overseas. You can see examples of that today. President Obama late last year ordered 100 trainers into Central Africa to work with the security course, uh, forces of four countries against this group called the Lord's Resistance Army, which is this virulent guerrilla group that, that kidnaps girls to be child brides and kidnaps boys to be their soldiers. We're not going in there, but we'll help, you know, the Ugandans and the Congolese and the South Sudanese fight it themselves. There's a small base in the Horn of Africa called Camp Le Manier, just a couple thousand American military personnel. It's a former French Foreign Legion base. That, I can share with you, was the lily pad for the Navy SEAL raid that rescued the kidnapped aid worker. Tiny base, nobody's heard of it. That's the way you want to be, small profile. Let the allies do it, let the partners do it. But what we can do is enable them, train them, work through them because what we need is, you know, the ability not to again deploy large numbers overseas. The problem with that, the history of predicting the next war, as you all know, is very, very bad. Which brings us to the crocodile closest to the canoe, which is Iran. Um, you know, we can talk during Q&A about where it may go or where it, where it might not go, but the biggest challenge for President Obama as he met with Netanyahu and vice versa, is the Israelis live in a tough neighborhood. They are very close to Iran. The experience of the Holocaust is with them every day. And while as a matter of American policy, we may want Israel not to attack, we may see a better policy moving forward, we should never for a second underestimate or undervalue how strongly the Israelis feel about this. Here's where the contradictions are. The Israelis fear that Iran is very quickly moving toward what the Israelis call the zone of immunity, when their nuclear infrastructure in Iran is so deeply buried or so scattered that it can't be taken out. What the U.S. says in response is, that may be a zone of immunity for you, but not for us. We have a capability against which there is no zone of immunity. And so what we want you to do is enter our zone of trust. And that's what the president said to Netanyahu. We have your back. We don't believe in containing Iran. We don't believe in deterring Iran. 
but they don't have a weapon yet. And in fact, U.S. intelligence, trust them or not, has found no evidence that the Iranian leadership has even made the decision to go to a weapon. But what Israel says is they want to get to the point where they're poised to get a weapon, just a few turns of the screwdriver, which for Israel is intolerable, but which Obama says, trust us, we can take care of it. And we've done a lot of reporting looking at the Israeli military capabilities, and we can get into details if, if you want, but Israel really cannot eradicate or dismantle the Iranian nuclear infrastructure. They could set it back, they could knock them back. They don't have the bunker-busting weapons sufficient to dig out the deeply buried sites. They don't have enough fighters and tankers to carry out the kind of sortie rate that would be required to really do it. So at best, they could set the Iranians back a couple of years. The U.S. has the sortie rate, has the weapons, has the electronic warfare and other tools to achieve dominance in the airspace over Iran. If the president gave the order, the U.S. could dismantle Iran's nuclear weapons infrastructure. But that should be a last resort. And the president says diplomacy has a chance, sanctions are biting, and in fact, just today, Iran contacted the P5 plus one set of negotiators under the European Union and said, hey, let's talk. Now, are they stalling for time or are they sincere? We just don't know, and it will take a couple you know, days, if not weeks, to find out. It's, it's really interesting. I guess here in Colorado Springs with the large military community, a lot of you probably know a lot of military personnel. There's probably some many veterans here today. But the loudest voice arguing against military action against Iran is the military. Because they're the ones that would have to deal with all the second and third order effects. You know, we know what day one might look like, the Israeli attack. We know what day two might look like, which is the Iranian retaliation, missiles on Tel Aviv, unleashing Hezbollah and Hamas for terror attacks around the world, perhaps funneling explosives to surrogates in Afghanistan in order to bloody and kill American troops. But that's the military problem. Day one and day two is very visible in the public debate. But the American military has to deal with day three out to year 10. And they see the incredible complications that an, an attack on Iran prematurely before it's required. So that's why American policy is nothing's off the table. We have Israel's back, but it's still too early to move to the kinetic option. I'm just curious, how many people here have served in the military? Well, thank you also very much for, for your service. And other than members of the academy, which I view as public service, how many of you are in the public service sector, serve in government positions or teachers or other things? Uh, that's great. Thank you all very much for, for what you, you, you do. It's, it's interesting because the default mode of democracy is, is, is peace. And it's hard to keep a nation on a war footing for a decade. And that's what, what we've been trying to do. It's even harder when the civilian leadership of both parties makes a political decision not to call for national sacrifice. And I, I think that this nation really can't sustain this war footing for much, much longer. And, and there's a, a real risk of an even greater bifurcation between the civilian sector and the real 1%, which is not the millionaires. The real 1% are those who serve the nation in uniform or the public service sector to make our country a better place. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, I mentioned earlier that I, I went into Afghanistan December of 01 uh, with the Special Forces team uh, with Hamid Karzai that actually captured Kandahar and, uh, and sort of ended that phase of, of the war. And it's what I've been doing for 10 years ever since. And when I first was embedded with them, of course, you know, no reporter had embedded with special forces since Vietnam, and they really didn't want to have me there, but they follow orders. And after a couple of days when they saw that I could carry my own gear and didn't mind eating ramen noodles three times a day and didn't freak out under fire, we kind of bonded and we got along really, really well. 
And as you all know, the military is very ritualistic. And so when I was about to unembed and head back to, uh, to, to the airbase at Kandahar Airfield, they had a little ceremony. It was 2 o'clock in the morning in the desert outside of Kandahar. Big campfire, that was the only source of light. We did the little ceremony, and everybody said a few words. And before I, I left and got into the, the Humvee to head back to the base, I said, you know, this was pretty risky for you guys. You know, New York Times reporter, embedded with special forces. You know, it would have been really bad for you if I would gotten killed. And they said, actually, we wouldn't have cared if you got killed. What would have been really bad for us is if you'd gotten lost. <laughs> and I've I've never forgotten that. And and to this day, I, I carry a little compass on my my watch just to remind myself. And and last night at the the lecture on campus, which was more about counterterrorism, which I'm happy to talk about as well. I'm always happy to flog my book. But um, you know, I was accused by. You know, somebody there, obviously very left-wing politics, I respect his point of view, who, who somehow thought I was advocating a national security state when I never said anything like that. In fact, I said just the opposite. I said, you know, the most important thing that all of us can do as individuals, as citizens of this country, is never forget the values of our country that make us great. Because if we surrender our values in the pursuit of the adversary, we are guaranteeing the adversary's success. So let's not get lost, OK? And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Um, generally, we, um, we, you ask the questions. I repeat it for the Pikes Peak Library District, and then Tom will answer. Yes. Can you comment on uh, the current discourse uh, in Pakistan? Right. <clears throat> this is where I wish I could do that Woody Allen bit where he goes behind the curtain and brings out Marshall McLuhan. Um, my my co-author, Eric Schmidt, is really the Washington Press Corps' leading expert on Pakistan. But since we can kind of you know channel each other, um, Pakistan is really one of the most dangerous national security risks facing us today. I mean, they are a nuclear power with a very weak central government and a military that is somewhat confused and an intelligence service that has very twisted loyalties. You know, I, I, I try to put myself in the shoes of the Pakistanis to try to understand. They really do view India as an existential threat. And they, you know, they were carved from India uh, in 48 in a bloodbath. They fought multiple wars with India. So we can't, just like we can't devalue Israel's existential fear of Iran with the bomb, we can't devalue Pakistan's existential fear of, of India. But this will probably get me in trouble. But you know, I've raised a couple teenage boys, and every now and then you have to say to them, you know, grow up, right? And, and if Pakistan really wants to be a member of the global community, it has to understand that as a nuclear power, it has certain responsibility. Pakistani intelligence services actually foment insurgent violence as a hedge against Indian influence. That's wrong. But it's a little bit like the guy who collects the poisonous snakes just to go bite the neighbor's kids. Those snakes are going to bite your kids too. And that's what's happening today in Pakistan. Now, unfortunately, not maliciously, but unfortunately, some of the American actions over, over recent months have made things worse. There were cross-border raids that were not malicious, but owing to breakdown in communications and some GPS signals that got crossed, US forces killed a number of Pakistani border frontier troops. And relations are as bad as they've ever been. So it's important now to rebuild those ties, to reopen the communications, and to help Pakistan respond and act like the mature country that it can and should be. Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with and appreciate your nonpartisan approach and the fact that you're not a editorial columnist. That said, 
Uh oh. There was, a, <laughs> <laughs> there was a, I thought, uh, everybody's reading the papers and seeing what's going on in Syria and the murdering of innocent people. And you're torn, you know, foreign policy, big picture, stay away. It's, it's, it's you know, don't, don't throw me in there. But on the other hand, you watch these people getting murdered. There was an op-ed piece in the journal this morning written by those who shall not be mentioned because the people of the paper are mad at me for saying their names. But it was an interesting thought that I've been thinking about all day. They said, why don't we just secure some areas in the northern part of Syria that are safe havens and let these people flow there and protect them? Would you care to comment on okay. that overall situation? Yeah. Okay. And that? Sounds familiar. Um, yeah. W what about the strategy of creating safe havens as a place for uh, people who are suffering uh, uh, political violence in Syria to escape to? Right. Um, I mean, that, that's actually kind of the proposal that John McCain is, is putting yes. forward. Um, there's a certain logic to it, but then you have to sort of say the what if. I mean, what if Syrian forces make a decision that if they can stand up to world outrage by slaughtering his own people, why can he not cite sovereign control of his own territory and send his tanks into this safe haven that is being secured by the U.S. or other Arab countries? I mean, it is a slippery slope to direct confrontation. So I'm not saying right or wrong, but let's just think through what this, this means. Um, you know, a lot of people said that Libya would be hard. And it turned out to take longer than people thought, but it really wasn't very hard. The difference with Syria is immeasurable. I mean, the Assad families hold on power, their military arsenal, their military hardware. And also what you have in Syria that you didn't have in Libya is you have not only the split in the two sects of the Muslim faith, but you have a large Christian minority that also fears being slaughtered if, if one side or the other. So we don't really know Syria well enough. We don't even know who to arm. And it seems to me that the first order of action should probably fall to those regional states and see what they might do. But thus far, the countries on the border don't seem interested. And if they're not interested, I guess it's going to be a difficult case to be made for the U.S. to again order military action yet again in the Muslim world when the most powerful al-Qaeda narrative to convince disenfranchised men between the ages of 18 and 25 to strap on a suicide vest, al-Qaeda's most powerful narrative is that the U.S. is at war with Islam, which we're not. But if you look at where we've dropped bombs for the last 11 years, there ain't a Catholic country on that list. Uh, yes, sir. We contain the Soviet Union and China. I love deterrence questions, yes. <laughs> who were much more powerful than Iran and have a lot of missiles and a lot of nukes. Why is Obama saying we can't contain Iran? given the risks to the economy and uh, our inability to sustain a long war with them at this time. It yes. seems like an easy thing to do. Yeah. Okay. A question is, given our success in our history uh, at containment, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the Soviet Union and, and China, why is Obama saying that we cannot contain Iran? Yeah, I mean, it's, this is a, a rich and fertile debate back in Washington. Um, Foreign Affairs magazine in the previous issue had two huge essays on either side of this, so that this question is being debated. Um, I would never speak for the president, and I guarantee he wouldn't want me to, but I often wonder when he says we can't contain Iran, what he's really saying to the Israelis, we're not adopting a policy of containment because we know that's unacceptable to you. Because there is a large school of thought, sir, that agrees with you that Iran could be contained and could be deterred. And I will share with you that there's a lot of, you know, 50-pound brains inside the Pentagon that are chopping on this question right now because of the what if. I mean, Iran in many ways might seem to be an ideal candidate for traditional deterrence. 
It's a country with a long history, could have a vibrant economy, a leadership that wants to survive. So all of the, the national values that the US or the Israelis could hold at risk to achieve a deterrent effect by altering their behavior seem to be there. The problem is when you have a guy like President Ahmadinejad pledging to burn Israel off the map, the sort of rational actor requirements for deterrence come into question. And then you have the other question that Iran has a history of being a state sponsor of terrorism. Bombings in Argentina, in Europe, the UK. So there is a concern that Iran with the bomb might choose an asymmetrical avenue of attack. Not firing a missile, but giving the bomb to a surrogate. So again, this is a very important debate. People feel very strongly on both sides of that question. And where you come down, is really where you stand on whether a preventive attack is required or not. But I assure you, there is a strong school of thought for the containment deterrent argument. Uh, yes, Whitney. Okay, so what's the U.S. response if the Israelis uh, make their move, a uh, preemptive attack on, on Iran? Yeah, I always like it when people ask questions that can be directly answered by a story I wrote last week. So I actually have that answer ready, and I thank you so much. I don't have to think too hard. Yeah, exactly. Um, I had a big page one story all about the day two scenarios. And again, you know, Please don't say you agree or disagree. I'm simply channeling for you the best thinking of the American military, American intelligence, Israeli military, and Israeli intelligence. Here's how they see it. After a somewhat limited Israeli attack designed to set back the Iranian program, which is about the most that we feel Israel could do, the Iranian leadership has to respond for two reasons. One, it has to show its own people that it is a sovereign state and a proud heir of the Persian legacy, you know, that goes back to the guys who, who you know, beat Greece all, all those thousands of, of, of years ago. But here's what Iran has to do according to this assessment. They have to manage the escalation so as not to do so much that either the U.S. feels it has to act to then defend Israel, or most of all, is attacked itself. So along the second line, Iran, according to these assessments, would unleash its surrogates against the US and its allies. So there's some thinking early on, oh, they'll launch missiles at the Fifth Fleet, oh, they'll shoot at the Lincoln or whichever carrier is in the Persian Gulf. The best thinking is that would be suicidal. Because to give the United States, you know, a true causus belli, by attacking an American military base or a ship would call in a force that could actually finish the job the Israelis can't. So Iran really has to manage its response to manage the escalation, to bloody Israel, to show the U.S. that they're not rolling over, but not do so much that they actually require the U.S. response. Iran has proven pretty smart at escalation management. The problem is, once you climb on that tiger, you don't always have a choice when to get off. And one of my great sources at the Fifth Fleet talks about what he calls the probability for buffoonery. And that's the great fear, the unintended consequences and escalation that cannot be managed. But the Israelis have actually worked out the fatalities that they predict in this rational escalatory scenario and it's in the handful of thousands. And what they're saying, better 40 rockets on Tel Aviv that kill several thousand people than an Iran with the bomb. And that's how the Israelis view it. So that's the scenario, sir. But you know, can that rational scenario come to pass? Where is your article for I'm sorry? Where is your article appearing? Oh, it was on page one of the New York Times last Tuesday or Wednesday. 
Yeah, nytimes.com. Just search for my, my byline. It's, it, it's there. Thank you. Sir? If we have, if we've left Iraq and we're vacating it militarily, why do we have such a large diplomatic uh, presence? Sixteen thousand people, one of the largest uh, diplomatic buildings in the world. Keep your eye on eBay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know that that embassy was built at at the peak of the war when everybody thought, with some justification, there would be a long-term military relationship much like we had with Germany after World War II or Japan. Nobody foresaw the desire of Maliki to be able to campaign on, I kicked out the occupiers, and President Obama's decision for some political purposes and for some you know, optic purposes to actually fulfill bringing all the troops home. That embassy is a white elephant, and there are already plans underway to drastically scale back the embassy personnel. And that building, as I said, you know, I, you know it's just it's a it's a waste right now, and it is it's the wrong building for a mission that people thought would come, and has just gone away. Going back to Iran for a minute, there's something going on this week in the news about. Um, Tom and John. <laughs> He's losing his power there because of the religious leader. Right. And there was an election. Yeah. And so is the religious leader trying to, to muzzle him? Or, or is, uh, in other words, there was even some uh, uh, talk that uh, he'd be gone soon. So what would that do? Okay, so it's a question pertaining to the uh, tension between religious leaders and the political leadership of Iraq. Of, of Iran. Iran. Um, a caveat up, up first, I am not a scholar on Iranian domestic politics. So there are people who can answer that better than I can. But what happened, there were parliamentary elections, and the delegates, the representation of those aligned with um, Ahmadinejad, this firebrand, uh, were actually decreased, and the traditional religious parties were on the increase. And this is one of the points that, you know, people who argue against attack say, Iran right now is a very divided country. You have the religious leadership and their adherents. You have Ahmadinejad and his kind of, you know, brown shirt crowd. And, and, and then you have, you know, a middle class of well-educated people who want to live well. And right now the sanctions are really, really biting. And I think the lack of support for Ahmadinejad could be read as evidence that the sanctions are having an effect on Iran's internal domestic politics. Will it be enough and will it be fast enough? Nobody knows. But the case can be made that the way to reunite the country is for Israel to attack. Okay, so um, what are the concerns about, among the major Sunni countries uh, in the Middle East uh, about a nuclear armed Iraq? And uh, could they be, I mean, <laughs> there I go again, Iran. And then, and, um, I'll just let you take it there. <laughs> I mean, that's really one of the conundrums for American policy because, you know, those countries, Saudi Arabia and others in particular, are quite fearful of a nuclear Iran because that would give them not hegemony, but much greater power in regional negotiations and in the balance of power in the region. So while they would never cheer an Israeli attack on 
Iran, and they certainly would not support and would have to denounce an American attack. In their geopolitical, geostrategic calculus, a nuclear Iran is not in their interests. And I think it's one of the sort of tier two, but still very compelling reasons to prevent Iran from ever getting a bomb is you would have nuclear proliferation across the Gulf. I mean, you know, the Emirates, the Saudis, the Kuwaitis have plenty of money to buy a nuclear weapon from somebody or to buy the know-how in order to counterbalance the Iranian bomb. And call me old fashioned, but I'm one of those guys who thinks the world's better off with fewer nuclear weapons and not more. Sir? Can you comment on uh, the use and effectiveness and the future of uh, contractors in both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah. Okay, can you comment on the use and effectiveness of contractors in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan? Thank you. Yeah, the, the use of war zone contractors is an absolutely unintended second order effect of shrinking the military um, because there simply aren't enough soldiers to do all the, the jobs that are required now. And so you have these contractors whose names you all know. Uh, now, they're, they're not just gun-toting security guys. They're contractors who are cooking food in the dining facilities and driving the fuel trucks and all of that. But it does introduce a certain vulnerability uh, to a mission when you have to rely on the private sector. And you also introduce um, opportunity for egregious behavior by the gun-toting security guys. Again, I'm not judging right or wrong, but you all are familiar with the shooting incidents where the contractors killed innocent Iraqi civilians that have put the entire mission in jeopardy. I mean, there's this traditional military concept of the strategic corporal, you know, the low-ranking person whose actions change the course of the war, and all those knuckleheads at Abu Ghraib, you know, they're in that category. Um, and now you have this whole class of civilian contractors who are, you know, working for the government but not under government control, whose behavior can affect the outcome in ways that diminish all of our security, and that's a problem. To what extent are they surrogates for the disappearing military influence? Okay, uh, follow up is to what extent are they surrogates for the disappearing military influence? They're surrogates for the shrinking military budget. I mean, look, if you all wanted to vote, you know, that $500 billion back and add some more, I mean, you know, we can put enough young men and women in uniform to do these jobs, but the American public uh, does not seem interested in doing that. Okay, so please comment on the second possibility of a second round of defense contract uh, cuts. Yeah. You know, the, the first round of cuts that produced the $489 billion I just spoke of, uh, you know, it's not popular to say, but you know what? The Pentagon did that without breaking a real sweat. You know, it wasn't easy, fair enough, but you know, there wasn't a lot of like, you know, beating stones to get blood out of them or whatever. Um, but, but smart people whose opinions I trust say that the next 500 billion really could hurt and really could dig into the meat of what the military's called on to do. I mean, the real problem is those budget cuts are being driven by the budget and not by a strategic view of the world. You want strategy to drive budgets. You don't want budgets to drive strategy. So at some point, you, the collective you, the American people, are gonna have to decide what is it exactly you don't want the military to do anymore to protect your security? Because yes, there's waste, and yes, there's fraud, and yes, there's redundancy. But at some point, the next half trillion and beyond is going to prevent the military from doing some important things they do today. And so where's the dialogue about what that will be? Most people predict we won't go to sequestration. In fact, some leading senators, both Democrats and Republicans, have pledged to introduce legislation to repeal the sequestration legislation if it gets there. So maybe it won't end so badly, but one thing I've, I've learned in Washington is, especially in this environment, don't bet on compromise. Scott? 
go back to the strategic corporal, um, figuratively. The uh, recent burning of Quran and other documents in Afghanistan, I can imagine, but you're on the inside and I'm not, I can imagine that that might have produced a sea change in attitude about the raison d'etre of our continued presence there. It might have been, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, when, when we're now pulling all the advisors out of the mission ministries because they might get shot by the people they're working with, uh, that change, there seems to be a sea change. Yeah. Could you talk about the internal conversation <coughs> sure. the can, sure. yeah. about how this plays out in our politics? Yeah. Did the recent uh, accidental burning of Qurans in Afghanistan lead to a sea change in our thinking about our policy there? Right. Once again, bless you, sir, for asking a question that I can answer with a story from last week. Um, we, we, we led the Monday paper with this exact story, and it is an incredibly fundamental thought, so thank you for asking. Um, I need to be careful about sourcing here, but when those two officers were shot inside the Ministry of the Interior, this was not a running down the hall shooting. They were inside a secure compartmentalized room with a key padlock on the, the door. So the person who got in was either someone they knew and trusted, someone who at a level who had access to that room, or somebody who had access to someone who did have access to that room. A lot of people said, well, maybe it was Taliban influence. And in a weird way, that would have been better because the Taliban have been our adversaries for 11 years. The bad news is those officers were not assassinated by the Taliban. They were assassinated by one of their brothers with whom they had worked and trained and fought. And so there really was, none of us can declare if it was a sea change or a tipping point or a turning point, but I guarantee we will look back on this as a milestone week in the campaign. I think a lot of people on the ground even those who are committed to the mission, had to stop and say, we've been dying and bleeding for Afghans for 11 years. And yes, the burning of the holy book was wrong, and it was stupid, but it was a mistake. It wasn't done maliciously out of protest to insult the religion. And if this is how people that we fight with and train with are going to treat us, maybe we have to rethink the mission. And even though the Ambassador Ryan Crocker and the top commander, General Allen, both said the mission remains unchanged, that's true kind of ipso facto, because what's the mission today? Get out. So of course that remains unchanged. What may change is the timetable, and I think we'll have to watch the NATO summit in May for perhaps an accelerated withdrawal timeline. Because I can share with you, even though the military and diplomats in Afghanistan are heroic in their commitment, um, political Washington, it was a real whiskey tango foxtrot moment for them. And they're saying, you know, well, you know what that means. <laughs> media puts a spotlight on something that's not that big of a deal in the country. You know, you don't know because you're not there, but it's like, I can remember some, you know, media events where everybody's really upset and I think, wow, I, was, I live on that block, I never even, you know. So, I don't know if that was going on or not, but it, it certainly stirred up Americans where they're going, you know, who needs this? You know, let's leave. You know, they, it, I mean, it's a book and you wrote in it, shame on you. You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> Was that real, or was that media like looking for the sound bites? I mean, in other words, of course, the, what happened was real, and the deaths are real. But the play out, like, does all of Afghanistan know about it and are upset, or is it just the media playing that one element up? Okay. So, what to, to what extent is our um, our perception of these events outsized due to kind of a media hype? There are times when, to be sure, the media can be accused of hyping a situation. But in Afghanistan, few people have televisions. Few people know how to read newspapers. So I don't know how you could have hyped it in Afghanistan to create the protests that followed. 
And that's a rhetorical question because I'll tell you what happened. This was in every Friday prayer. This was the word in the market. This was not the American media hyping everything. This outraged the Afghan people who communicated among themselves in the traditional forms of tribal communications. So to be sure, ma'am, your question is valid in many cases, but this was not a Western media hype. This was an internal Afghan outrage that was communicated in every mosque and madras across the country. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that over time and in different places our mission set has changed. But you also mentioned in the briefing that our national, uh, mentioned about our national interests. Have you observed that our national interests have endured? In other words, those, those underwriting principles for which the mission sets have been originally established have changed. Have you observed that the, uh, the national interests in that region have also changed over time or not? OK, so to what extent has the um, enduring American national interest transformed over the course of the conflict? It's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about it exactly in those words, so I guess I'll ponder, without having thought it through, that it really has changed a, a little bit. Um, I mean, again, as I try to say about Afghanistan, the mission went from one, which was to kick out the Taliban, roust al-Qaeda, to one to try to build Switzerland, to one where we don't care anymore so long as al-Qaeda can't operate from there. And I think that's true of the entire region to, to, to step back. I mean, our, our country, I mean, even though we are a global power, we really have such an immature understanding of the world around us. Um, in our, our book, Counter-Strike, that I wrote with Eric, which is an assessment of the last 10 years of counterterrorism strategy, we talk about the morning of 9-11 when those reporters and specialists who had covered al-Qaeda knew immediately by the signature, you know, multi-pronged, simultaneous mass casualty attack. There's only one terrorist organization in the world that thinks that way and has done that. East Africa embassy bombings follow that as well. But even though we knew what al-Qaeda was, there were senior people on the National Security Council walking around saying al-who. I mean, they just didn't know who it was. And another really eye-opening in insight, and again, our, our book is, you know, like Johnny Cash, it's right down the line, we, we walk the line, we, 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 we criticize equally and we compliment equally, but it was shocking to us to learn that George Bush, the war on terror president, never once convened the National Security Council to sort of answer your question. What is our counterterrorism strategy? What's our long-term goal? What do we want the world to look like at the end of this thing? Can you even get to an end of this thing? The National Security Council met on terror financing and whether to declare this guy a terror leader and all that, but they never stepped back sort of answer your very good question. So if our government never stopped to ask it, you know, I'm not sure I, I can really answer it. And it really wasn't until Don Rumsfeld wrote that famous long, hard slog memo in 2005. We have a long description in our book about how that came about. And, and Rumsfeld said, you know, is our, you know, strategy of capturing and killing terrorists, and that was all the strategy was for a year or two, is that strategy actually creating more terrorists than we're taking off the battlefield? We, at that point, we always have to tell our editors, you know, just because Rumsfeld said it doesn't automatically make it wrong. Uh, and, 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 and in this case, Rumsfeld had it exactly right. And even though he was wrong on a lot of things, he really launched the kind of whole of government effort that you see today, which has achieved a lot of advancements, both in counterterrorism and in the, the broader arena of national security policy. So it's a great, it's a better question than my answer, and I just don't think there is an answer. Okay, we have time for two more questions. The gentleman in the back. Assuming that there is not an Israeli attack on Iranian nuclear facilities in the near term, what do you think the effect of current and planned economic sanctions would be on Iran? Okay. Assuming no Israeli attack, what is the long-term economic and political effect of sanctions on Iran? Yeah, I, I dare not hazard a prediction because there's so many variables, but I can tell you what the desired end state is. I mean, to the question about strategy, what do they want to have happen? 
they want the economic isolation and sanctions to so disturb a broad mass of the Iranian people that they rise up and peacefully change their government to one that is still Islamist. Of course, it's who they are, but is one, but is one that is less hostile to Israel and to its neighbors and joins you know, the regional community. So a country like that, even if it had the wherewithal of nuclear weapons, so long as it didn't weaponize, is probably a country that the U.S. would say we can live with. Is that possible? I, I, I don't know. But, you know, I, I covered the war in, in Bosnia for, for three years, and, you know, all sides were, were, were guilty of aggression. The Croats, the Muslims, the Serbs. But I think saying that doesn't absolve us of the right to say who was the greater aggressor who started it. And the Serbs were, of course, the, the greater aggressor. But there was a really interesting kind of you know, peacenik liberal group in Serbia that really opposed the war in Bosnia. And they were great sources because they were journalists and government officials and they were educators. And they felt that, they, so they had a very rational view about Bosnia. But once you talked about Kosovo, they would have this Linda Blair moment where their head would spin around and the green bile of racism would, would come out. And, and so even the most thoughtful humanistic Serb on the question of Bosnia became an absolute gun-toting patriot when it came to those dirty Albanians in Kosovo. And that's the way the Iranian people are. Left, right, or center, they are a proud people with a long tradition. And we can never hope to have an Iran that doesn't want to be a major player in the region. And they see part of that as having this nuclear program. And so how do we manage those relations to get to an Iran that has the aspirations but doesn't weaponize and is not hostile to, to other interests? Final question? OK, it looks like we've tapped out all the questions. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on April 11th. And thank you to Tom Shanker. His book is Counter-Strike. <laughs>